Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. To exit FNA if Greylist Pakistan asks Taliban to haunt for Jaish-e Mohammed Chief Masood Azhar in Afghanistan. 21 years after 9-11, the war continues in Afghanistan against Al-Qaeda and other terror groups. And Indian security forces continue counter operations to wipe out terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, which recently claimed that Jaish-e Mohammed Chief Masood Azhar is possibly hiding in Afghanistan in a desperate bid to be removed from the FADF grey list. However, such claim proved to be an embarrassment for Islamabad when the Taliban asserted that Masood is in Pakistan. On September 14th, Afghanistan rejected the claim, adding that such unverified allegations can affect ties between both the nations. This claim from the Pakistani side is being made against a backdrop of pressure from the West on the country to take action against Azhar. A report. In a move to hogwash the Financial Action Task Force, Pakistan has written a letter to Afghanistan to arrest Jaish Muhammad Chief Maulana Masood Azhar. Amid the mounting pressure over terror funding in Pakistan, the country is establishing a narrative that Azhar, who is most wanted by the Indian government, is hiding in Nangarhar province of Afghanistan. This is just another Pakistan's attempt to comply with the Financial Action Task Force mandate and get off the intergovernmental organization's grade list. As earlier, Pakistan was finding it difficult to trace Azhar. But now, just before the FATF meeting in October, the country is not only accepting his presence, but claiming that he's hiding in Afghanistan. Now, Masood Azhar is internationally proscribed terrorist, but telling that they, he is in Afghanistan, asking Afghanistan to deliver, and yesterday we know that the Afghan uh, the spokesman said that they are under the Pakistan's protection, Masood Azhar. So, this is a game that they are trying to play to hoodwink the international community, and it is something that is not going to convince the world that Pakistan has abdicated terrorism as an instrument of foreign policy. This move by Pakistan is nothing but Islamabad's desperation to get off the FATF's grey list as it comes just ahead of meeting of the Global Watchdog in October, which will consider Pakistan's grey list status. In fact, it has become a routine for Islamabad to come up with farcical actions prior to key international meetings. Similar moves were recently with the arrest of Sajid Mir, the main handler of 2008 Mumbai terror attacks. Sajid, who was once declared dead by Pakistan, has now been convicted and sentenced to 15 years in jail. Hafiz Said, founder of the Lashkar-e Taiba terror outfit, on whom the US has placed 10 million US dollars bounty, was sentenced to 31 years in jail ahead of the FATA plenary meeting in Paris. The action against Jesh Chief Masood Azhar now comes as part of the plan to appease FATF. According to Indian intelligence report, Masood Azhar is enjoying the patronage of the Pakistani establishment in Bahawalpur city of Punjab province. Pakistan is also home to numerous terror organizations, five being India-centric, including lashkar e taiba and Jaish-e-Muhammad. The United States has even exposed Pakistan for providing a launching pad to many foreign terror organizations like Islamic State and the Taliban. The FATF had started uh, investigations uh, into the Pakistan's terror links and uh, they had asked them to get come clean on it and to avoid that and to somehow show to the international community that they are taking appropriate actions. They occasionally uh, try to arrest some of them 
and then release them or they were living in the house arrest. At the end of the day, you know, you cannot in today's time and age where information flows in real time that this can be done. So in my view, this is just to somehow get out of the situation so that they are not blacklisted under the FATF. They are still in the gray list, have been there for two years and are trying to get out of it very quickly. So it is, in my opinion, it is eyewash. It is not a significant thing, but they must not forget that eventually this comes to bite them. Pakistan's list of FATF shared actionable items does not accurately represent its commitment to battling terrorism. In reality, the nation continues to serve as a refuge for terrorists and organizations that finance terrorism. The biggest example is the lack of action against Talha Saeed, the new face of Jamaat Dawa organization and the son of 2611 mastermind Hafi Saeed. According to intelligence agencies, Talha is next in line to take over functions of JUD, the parent body of the globally proscribed terror outfit lashkar e -Taiba. Despite mounting evidence implicating Pakistan in funding international terrorism, the government has made little progress against it at home. Truth be told, Islamabad has only taken cosmetic measures before of each FATF plenary meeting, which has placed Pakistan on its grey list for failing to stop the financing of terrorism and money laundering. While the nation continues to be a haven for terrorists in reality, only token efforts are made to remove the nation from the FATF's grey list. The world remembered 9-11 with readings of victims' names, volunteer work and other tributes 21 years after the deadliest terror attack on US soil. The World Trade Center's Twin Towers were destroyed by the hijacked plane attacks on September 11, 2001. The US started Operation Enduring Freedom after that against Al-Qaeda and other terror groups. The US has been continuously engaged in anti-terror operations but the killings of both Osama bin Laden and Zawari pose serious questions before Pakistan and the Afghan government as to how two of the world's most wanted fugitives were able to hide right in their backyards. Take a look. People world over commemorated the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 attacks that shocked the United States and killed nearly 3,000 people. In 2001, the hijackers, members of the Afghanistan-based terrorist group Al-Qaeda, took control of commercial planes and used them as missiles, crashing into New York's World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a Pennsylvania field. The incident changed the world thereafter, becoming a turning point in the global political discourse. We regained the light by reaching out to one another and finding something all too rare a true sense of national unity. To me, that's the greatest lesson of September 11. The U.S. administration, headed by the then U.S. President George W. Bush, launched a war against terror and sent American troops to Afghanistan where the Taliban were ruling. Osama bin Laden, the head of Al-Qaeda, was the prime target. There were two declared objectives of the U.S.-led NATO military operation. One, dismantling al-Qaeda, and two, removal of the Taliban from power in Afghanistan to create a democratic state. The U.S. toppled the Taliban, whose patronage combined with covert support from the Pakistan military had emboldened and strengthened al-Qaeda over the years. Today we stand together to remember a day of horror and loss. But we also remember a day of monumental courage and compassion. A day when people responded to evil and fanaticism with goodness and generosity. A day that called forth the heroism that dwells in the hearts of Americans across this land. 
Many of those acts of bravery ha happened right here where we're standing. Our colleagues at the Pentagon risked their own safety to rescue their teammates. They moved rubble with their bare hands. American forces' military presence in Afghanistan continued for more than two decades, and billions of dollars were spent over the war. On May 2, 2011, the U.S. Special Forces killed Al-Qaeda founder Osama bin Laden in Pakistan's Abbottabad in Operation Neptune Spear. The fact that bin Laden was hiding in Pakistan exposed Islamabad's failure to track down, or failure to reveal the hideout of America's most wanted terrorist. The U.S.-led NATO forces left Kabul in 2021, but the war against terror continues in Afghanistan and neighboring Pakistan. Despite the Taliban takeover, the U.S. located the second general emir of Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, and killed him in a drone strike in August this year. Al-Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden plotted the 9-11 attacks together, and he was also one of America's most wanted terrorists. The killings of both Osama bin Laden and al-Zawahiri, however, pose serious questions before Pakistan and the Afghan government as to how two of the world's most wanted fugitives were able to hide right in their backyard. The United States' counterterrorism measures and surveillance have so far prevented any other major terrorist attacks emerging out of Afghanistan. However, observers believe that terrorist threats persist and that other terrorist groups like the Islamic State Khorasan province are gaining a foothold in the region. With improved intelligence and law enforcement at the domestic level, Washington has developed a network of allies who are capable of preventing an incident similar to what it tragically suffered 21 years ago. However, the U.S. cannot afford to ignore the possibility of a terrorism resurgence and a threat of future terror attacks. People in Washington are also aware that the Taliban never completely severed its alliance with al-Qaeda. The neighboring Pakistan-based Haqqani network is also involved in the equation, which only amplifies the threat. While U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan may have been hailed as respecting the sovereignty of the country, the fact remains that the ground reality in Afghanistan remains the same, and the United States and others around the world need to keep a continued vigilant eye on day-to-day -day happenings in Afghanistan. Once the fear of cross-border movement of terrorists, arms and ammunition is eliminated, the people of Jammu and Kashmir would decisively defeat the proxy war with the help of security forces. Security forces in Kashmir are continuing their operations to wipe out terrorism from Jammu and Kashmir. In the latest operation, Jammu and Kashmir police apprehended a hybrid terrorist identified as Zafar Iqbal, a resident of Riyasi district, and recovered arms and ammunition from his possession. Airport. Pakistan does all in its power to promote unrest and violence in Jammu and Kashmir as it is outraged by the stability and advancement in the region. However, the Indian security forces are conducting a number of operations to destroy the network of Pakistan-backed terrorism. Recently, terrorist organizations operating in the valley just suffered a severe blow. In the latest operation, Jammu and Kashmir police apprehended a hybrid terrorist identified as Zafar Iqbal, a resident of Angrala Tehsil in Riyasi district, and recovered arms and ammunition from his possession. According to police officials, Iqbal was in touch with terrorist handlers in Pakistan. Not only that, just a day before this crackdown, security forces neutralized two terrorists of Ansar Ghazwatul Hind terror group at Naugam area on Srinagar city outskirts. Acting on a piece of specific information regarding the presence of terrorists in the Naugam area of Srinagar, Jammu and Kashmir police and security forces launched a joint cordon and a search operation in the area. During the search operation, as the joint search party approached towards the suspected spot, the hiding terrorists fired indiscriminately upon the joint search party, which was retaliated effectively, leading to an encounter. As per police report, both the slain ultras were involved in the killing of a laborer from West Bengal. A 
very strong nexus between global organized crime and terrorism. And Pakistanis have built a very strong infrastructure here as well. It's not that all people of Pakistan are involved in this, but people who are in the military establishment, people who are mega criminals, people who are involved in financial crime, everyone who's involved in these, they have to stay, the, uh, rather retain their relevance. And these people have to continuously foment something or the other. Simultaneously, one more thing has happened that uh, a very uh, negative ecosystem, you can say, negative ecosystem of uh, Islamic radicalism is there. People are very emotive about it. And once you're fighting a holy war or jihad, uh, no crime, even drug trafficking, even money laundering, even extortion, everything appears reasonable and justified. So this is a self-sustaining wheel or self-sustaining machine which is there. And for that, Pakistan, Pakistani military establishment has to continue to foment. Jammu and Kashmir has witnessed a rapid development since after the abrogation of Article 370 to end its special status. There was also a decline in terror-related incidents and cross-border infiltration. However, in the past few days, there has been a spate of incidents when terrorists have targeted many civilians, especially from the minority community. As per the report of South Asia Terrorism Portal, 804 incidents of attacks by terrorists have taken place in Jammu and Kashmir in the last three years. The highest numbers of incidents, 321, were reported in 2020 and 209 incidents have taken place till September this year. As Kashmir is heading towards more peace and prosperity, Pakistan being envious of this development is busy hatching wily plots to incite terrorism in the valley. However, they have just been caught off balance by assertive Indian forces and their nefarious plans have been blown into ashes. Several sympathizers of terrorists and hundreds of overground workers associated with lashkar e taiba jaish muhammad Hezbollah Mujahideen and similar other outfits and their affiliates have been apprehended in recent days. According to the sources in security establishment, nearly all the terrorists involved in the killings of civilians in Jammu and Kashmir in recent past have been neutralized and armed forces are now focusing on intelligence-based surgical operations to deal with the terrorists in the Union Territory with an aim to minimize collateral damage. The emergence of such kinds of outfits is to ensure the links of any big terror attack do not go back to Pakistan or at least to the designated outfits. Experts believe that Pakistan will not amend its malicious strategies unless it is blacklisted by the Financial Action Task Force. Security forces within the country, they are doing a good job because this war is very difficult to fight where, you know, the terrorists or insurgents, they are hiding uh, amongst people, they are using civilian population as a shield. So most of them, security forces are able to apprehend and kill. But as long as that uh, dangerous and poisonous pond, which is called Pakistan, where this uh, terror factory is uh, being run, isn't it, along with organized crime, as long as that terror factory is running, it's going to be difficult. Throughout history, Pakistan has sought to undermine India's stability, its unity and its integrity with varying degrees of intensity. This strategy is not likely to alter. However, Indian security forces are always vigilant, alert and capable of giving a befitting reply. After the targeted killings in the region, Indian security forces have taken a plethora of strategically key initiatives aimed at boosting its counter-terrorism strategy. Islamabad should now understand that any attempt to challenge India's integrity will be disastrous for it. Since the day Taliban took power in Afghanistan, it started pushing women back in time. 
The de facto rulers are trying their best to remove women from public life. They are closing girls' schools, denying them right to education, establishing a Stone Age regime with barbaric laws. They are reversing decades of women's achievement. Recently, at United Nations Human Rights Council, Afghan journalist Mehbooba Siraj made an impassioned plea for solid international action to address the gender apartheid in their country. A report. The Taliban takeover of Afghanistan nearly a year ago has reshaped society, most of all for Afghan women and girls. New laws restrict their movement, education and dictate what they can wear. In the most recent occurrence, the all-male interim administration in eastern Afghanistan's Bakhtia province closed middle and high schools for girls that had momentarily opened following a decision by tribal elders and regional educational administrators. Following the decision, dozens of Afghan girls protested in the streets against the Taliban's rule. Over the past 12 months, human rights violations against women and girls have mounted steadily in Afghanistan. Despite initial promises that women would be allowed to exercise their rights within Sharia law, including the right to work and to study, the Taliban has systematically excluded women and girls from public life. Recently, at United Nations Human Rights Council, Afghan journalist Mehbooba Siraj made an impassioned plea for solid international action to address the gender apartheid in their country since the Taliban swept to power last year. I walk in the streets of Kabul. A Talib comes and looks at me, but that Talib does not see me. I, I don't exist in front of him, not me. All of us, the women of that country, we don't exist. He just looks at us and then that's it. We are, we are erased. Do you know what that feeling is? To be erased? I'm erased and I don't know what else to do. This is the last hope and this is the last time I'm going to come somewhere and talk about this to the world because I'm sick and tired of doing it and I'm not going to do it anymore. How many times am I supposed to yell and scream and say, world, pay attention to us, we are dying. Taliban overthrew the elected government of Afghanistan last August, established a Stone Age regime with barbaric laws and reversed centuries of women's achievement. They imposed a primitive government with brutal rules and undead centuries of progress for women. The hardliners denied millions of women the opportunity to receive an education, ousted tens of thousands of women from their positions in the government, and outlawed their enterprises and any sort of activism. An estimated 3 million secondary school girls are shut out of school for more than a year now. Today, they have plunged Afghan women into the dark ages again, and women in the country have even lost the right to life. In March, the Taliban went back on the promise to allow girls to attend high schools, claiming that they would remain closed until a plan was developed that would allow them to reopen in conformity with Islamic law. Afghan women have also been banned from traveling alone and can only visit public gardens and parks in the capital on days separate from men. In May this year, the country's supreme leader and chief of the Taliban, Hebatullah Akhanzada, even ordered women to fully cover themselves in public, including their faces, ideally with an all-encompassing burqa. At first, a few Afghan ladies protested modestly by pushing back against the limits. However, the Taliban quickly apprehended the ringleaders, incarcerated them without charge and kept them under house arrest. As of August 15th of 2021, in a matter of 24 hours, I saw a democracy that the world worked on for the past 20 years disappear in front of my eyes in 24 hours. It was like it never existed before. That's how the democracy was fundamental in Afghanistan. A century ago, the women of Afghanistan were free. They enjoyed the right to education, right to political participation and the right to movement. 
even in the 1970s, in Kabul's universities, women made up more than 60% of students and they were equally represented in several public institutions. Under the Taliban rule, the right of women and girls have worsened. Additionally, Afghanistan is in the midst of a severe humanitarian and economic catastrophe. Where previously there was hope with women having a key role in society, there is now starvation, destitution and violence. It is so difficult to imagine how much has changed for so many in such a short period of time. Afghan women are repeatedly urging the international community to step in and support the women in the war-torn country. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.